Hello and welcome to our worship service here at Palmetto Church of Christ. So glad that you could join us. Uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn over the book of Daniel. And just a little bit, we'll be in the book of Daniel. Before we do that, I want to lead us in a word of prayer. And uh, I want to use a passage from the book of Daniel itself in my prayer. And then I'll close it out uh, with my own words. This is the passage in Daniel where Daniel thanks God for revealing the dream, interpreting the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. So let's bow together. Holy Father, praise be your name forever and ever. Wisdom and power are yours. You change times and seasons. You depose kings and you raise up others. You give wisdom to the wise. You give knowledge to the understanding. You reveal deep and hidden things. And Father, you know what lies in darkness and light dwells with you. I thank you and praise you, God of our ancestors. You've given us wisdom and power and you have made known to us what we ask of you. And Father, at this time, we continue to ask your blessing on this nation and especially on your church that during this time of great upheaval that we might be your light to a nation that doesn't always share our values. And Father, now as we talk about your word, as we have communion together, as we pray together, may it all be done for your glory, for your honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King Rise among us, let it rise, let it rise. Oh, let it rise, let it rise. Oh, let it rise, let it rise. Let, it rise. let the glory of the Lord rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 4. Chapter 4 will be there in just a minute. We're in a series in the book of Daniel. Before we get into Daniel, I want to thank uh, those who are back there helping today. We've got Beetle Teal, who's running the PowerPoint, and Matt Kreger's doing the live stream. Kevin Grindstaff is doing the sound. Warren Mitchell's doing the security. And then later on, Chip Holton's going to lead us in our thoughts for communion. And then Ed Brown, one of our elders, is going to lead us in the shepherd's prayer. Some of you may not have heard, but I am a TV star. Actually, my wife, Lane, and I both are TV stars. <laughs> Last year, about, I think it was in October, we were invited to take part 
in a television show, Spiritual Outdoor Adventures, done by a guy by the name of Jimmy Seitz, a preacher of the gospel, and he invited us to come to the Clarendon Club in Somerton, South Carolina, and take part in a hunt. And so we did that, very excited, but I had a wonderful, wonderful time. And I was looking forward for a number of months for this to air. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were two episodes. We got to watch it on TV, and I was just so highly excited, couldn't wait to see it happen. I had filmed myself uh, shooting a deer with a 4K camera, and I wanted to see how that looked on television. Well, when it finally aired a couple of weeks ago, first of all, I understood the old adage that uh, when you're on TV, it adds at least 20 pounds. It looked like I had eaten at least a couple of the cameras. Anyway, <laughs> you, you add to that fact that my moment in the spotlight was not quite as smooth as I thought it would be. Let me explain to you what I mean. After I had uh, shot the deer, we were supposed to reenact the scene. You turn the camera around, and this is some of the behind-the-scenes things that you do. You reenact the scene in order to give them a footage and a shot. Well, I gave them several different choices. The first two that I walked through, I tried to be excited but composed. I tried to be cool. And then the third one that I did for them was I just did an over-the-top one for the fun of it. And that night when we all got together and we reviewed the footage, there were different people hunting, and we would sit there, watch the TV, review all the footage. When we came to the third take uh, that I did just for fun, over-the-top reaction, everybody laughed. We never thought that would be the one that would go on TV. They would never choose that. <laughs> well, you guessed it. That was the one that they chose, they chose the over-the-top reaction, the one that the whole crew had laughed at. I was, turned out to be comical rather than cool. <laughs> we all need to be humbled at times, don't we? You know, for some people, it doesn't take much to humble them. They have a tender heart. They're folks who never really get uh, full of themselves. They're never full of pride. But for some, it takes a whole lot to humble them. Maybe you know some folks like that. They have this overinflated sense of self. And in fact, they, like the old joke goes, they wrote the book, Humility and How I Attained It. Uh, well, in our passage today in Daniel chapter 4, we're going to look at the story of a man that was not easily humbled. One of the things that makes Daniel chapter 4 so unique is the entire chapter is a personal letter from King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to the empire. It's just a personal testimony about what God had done to humble him, and it took a lot to humble Nebuchadnezzar. And so we're going to get into it right away. We're going to start by looking at Nebuchadnezzar offering the letter to his people. Let's begin now in verse 1, Daniel chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. Now, let's stop right there for just a minute. Does this sound a little bit familiar to you? I mean, chapter 4 kind of starts out, it unfolds the same way that chapter 2 does in a way. If you recall, very early in Daniel's captivity, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that disturbs him, and all of the wise men of Babylon try to interpret it. And to make a long story short, God enables Daniel to interpret the dream, and King Nebuchadnezzar ends up promoting Daniel to a position, a high position in Babylon. But now we come to chapter 4. It is now decades later, and Nebuchadnezzar is calling on Daniel once again to interpret a dream. By the way, did you notice here that Daniel is the chief of the magicians? 
Daniel is managing the witches, the astrologers, and the sorcerers. In other words, Daniel is managing people who are doing things that God hates, that he abhors. You know, some of you, maybe you work with people who are far from God, people who do stuff that God despises. Daniel would say, I get it. I understand exactly what you're dealing with. He is managing some very ungodly people, people who don't share his values, which brings us, by the way, to the question that we've been asking during this whole series. It's the basis of the series, and it's this. How do you live a life of integrity and influence in a culture that doesn't share your values? And how do you do it without being obnoxious? How do you do it without being a jerk? Daniel's been teaching us that and how to do that. And you notice, by the way, he, he, that Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel, I know that the spirit of the holy, this is verse 9, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Now, what's interesting is, is that Daniel doesn't correct Nebuchadnezzar when he says this. When he says the spirit of the holy gods is in you, he doesn't correct him. He just lets that slide. Now, sometimes that's a habit of Daniel. He doesn't correct the king when he continues to call him Belshazzar. That is his Babylonian name. He's named after a pagan god. Nebuchadnezzar named him after a pagan god of Babylonia. He doesn't, correct the, he doesn't even correct the king when the king says, I want you to manage all of the magicians and the sorcerers and astrologers. He doesn't say anything. He just lets that one slide as well. Now, why? Why does he pick and choose his battles? Why does he let things and something slide? I think it's because we mentioned this last week that Daniel realizes that lost people are going to act like lost people because they're lost people. And that shouldn't be a surprise. Daniel's going to pick and choose his battles. And right now, he chooses to talk to King Nebuchadnezzar about his dream. So the king goes on to tell Daniel about his dream. Pick it up now in verse 10. Verse 10, these are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From, for, from it, every creature was fed. In the visions... I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger come down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. That's seven years, by the way. The decision is announced by the messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and he gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belshazzar, tell me what it means for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. So here we are. Once again, Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel to interpret a dream. Can you, can you tell me what this means? Now, I find it real interesting, Daniel's reaction to this. Look at verse 19. Verse 19, we read, Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. In other words, <laughs> your majesty, if only this was about people that you didn't like, I would feel better about it. Daniel goes on to say, You, your majesty, you are that tree, and you're about to be chopped down. Now, Daniel is going to say some very challenging things to a very powerful man here, but he's not going to enjoy it. You know, there are some people who, when they correct others, you can almost see it in their face, they enjoy it. Daniel's not going to enjoy it. In fact, he wishes this were about the king's enemies. But here's what he says in verse 24. Verse 24, 
This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree that the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice, renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Now, I want to point out something that we've noticed before about Daniel. Notice that while Daniel challenges King Nebuchadnezzar, he's still being really respectful about it. He's not obnoxious about it. And we talked about that in previous lessons again, how that as followers of Christ, there is a difference between being courageous and obnoxious, and we need to know the difference. Daniel's not obnoxious about it. He addresses the king respectfully, and he feels a real burden to have to do this. He's saying, I wish this was about somebody else rather than you. And then he pleads with the king, king, please accept my advice. And remember, it's important to understand, Daniel's not doing this every day. <laughs> he's, he's let a lot of things slide. Remember that. I say that because there are some Christians that feel like they're the moral police of our culture, that they're all the time running around correcting people left and right. Daniel has been serving under King Nebuchadnezzar for a long, long time, and you know this is not something that happens every day. But God has opened a door for Daniel to speak to Nebuchadnezzar in power, and he's given Daniel something to say to this powerful king. And so Daniel's going to say it, and it takes remarkable courage to do what he does. It really does. Basically, he's telling a king, a king, by the way, who has a reputation of dispatching people with just a whim, he's going to say, listen, this empire you have, it really doesn't belong to you. And by the way, king, neither do you. Both you and your empire belong to God. To speak that kind of truth to someone who is in power takes a whole lot of courage. And not only that, I mean, he speaks really directly about the beef that God has with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel tells him he needs to renounce his sins by doing what's right and renounce his wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. I wonder if anyone's ever spoken to Nebuchadnezzar this way before. Probably not. When you're in a position of power, not a lot of people will tell you the truth. By the way, that's why it's so hard sometimes for the rich and the famous and the powerful to really find anybody to tell them the truth. <laughs> because the people that serve the rich and the famous, the powerful, they don't want to lose the favor of the rich and the famous and the powerful. And so one of the lessons I think we learn here that if you're a person who has influence, if you're a leader of any kind, if you own a business, or if you were in government, uh, if you're a leader in the community or at your job, you need to hold on to people that love you enough to tell you the truth. Uh, we have quite a few people in the world. The world is full of yes men and yes women. We don't need any more of those. Daniel's speaking truth to a person of power because he knows that there is a greater power behind and above Nebuchadnezzar. Ultimately, Daniel is loyal to a power that's over Nebuchadnezzar, the Most High God. So basically, Daniel says, here's the meaning of the dream. You're about to be cut down. And I'm advising you, king, please accept my advice, how to respond. You need to repent. Well, what happens? What does Nebuchadnezzar do? Well, let's pick it up in verse 28, Daniel 4, 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal palace by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Wow. A lot of ego happening there. Right? I'm reminded of the words of Ashley Brilliant who once said, All I ask of life is a constant and exaggerated sense of my own importance. That's funny, but that's, that's true of so many of us. So listen, it is just a year later, and Nebuchadnezzar has already forgotten the dream and the conversation with Daniel. And it's a reminder that sometimes we so quickly forget the stuff that God has told us. 
He's forgotten the dream. He's forgotten Daniel's warning. He's forgotten the advice. And so what we read next is the dream coming true for Nebuchadnezzar. Pick it up now in verse 31. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. You ever try to imagine that? Imagine for a moment that was to happen to, say, the President of the United States. <laughs> imagine if in the middle of his term, a President of the United States just loses it. You know, someone says, Where the, where's, you seen the President? Where is he? He's out in the Rose Garden eating grass. Can you imagine that? Nebuchadnezzar is driven away from people. He's eating grass like an ox. Read on, verse 33 and following. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and nails like the claw of a bird. And by the way, you know, that can happen in seven years. After, after three months of lockdown with COVID, some of you were looking pretty rough. I know that. Imagine after seven years, all right? Verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. By the way, take note of the order of that, would you? Raise my eyes toward heaven and then his sanity was restored. Read on. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now that last line there tells you that Nebuchadnezzar is finally getting it. All those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. You know, he's got a ways to go. He's still learning. He's not there yet. But he realizes, this is what God was trying to address with me. He was trying to address my pride. And he awakens to the fact that everything that he has is not because of him. It's because of God. It's because of God. Uh, remember a story about Denzel Washington? Maybe you've heard it before, and by the way, on the overhead, there's a picture of Denzel and his mom when he was younger. But he, uh, Denzel tells the story about how after he had just gotten into act, acting, I think he had already maybe received one Academy Award. He went home to see his mom, and he was feeling a little bit full of himself, he says. And uh, he said to his mom when he went in, he said, did you ever imagine that you would see your son with all of this? Did you ever imagine that your son would be a star? Denzel says he said that to his mom. And his mom, he said his mom was like, please, first of all, you don't know how many people have been praying for you and for how long. And he, he says, then she told me to get a bucket and a squeegee and clean the windows. I like that, don't you? Denzel said that this was kind of a reality check for him, that he needed to be reminded that he didn't get there all by himself. That where he was at was a result of God's grace and a whole lot of people praying for him. Listen, never is a person more out of touch with reality, more certifiably insane than when they think that what they've got and what they've done is what they've got and what they've done all by themselves and it's really all about them. Part of what I want us to see about this text is the truth is that Nebuchadnezzar really went insane before his hair grew out like an eagle and before his nails grew long like a bird's claws, before he started walking around on all fours and eating grass like an ox. He didn't go insane in that pasture. He was certifiably insane when he was on the roof thinking he had done all of it by himself. 
He was insane when he was walking on the roof of his palace thinking that he had accomplished all of this by himself and it was all about him. Do you know what it means to be eccentric? You know, whenever I read this story about Nebuchadnezzar, I don't know why, but my, I guess it's thinking about the nails and the long hair. I always think about Howard Hughes. You remember the billionaire who kind of went off the deep end and uh, grew his fingernails long, his hair long, he stayed uh, secluded, and people called him eccentric. Do you know what the word eccentric means? The word eccentric literally means off-center, off-center. And when God ceases to be the center of your life, you are eccentric. You are off-center. One driving question for this series has been, how do you live a life of integrity and influence when you live in a culture that doesn't share your values? You know, you and I live in American culture that is eccentric where it's all about me, it's all off-center. And certainly you and I have our days when we are eccentric, when we're off-center, when we think that life revolves around us and that we're at the center of life. And listen, part of what we're learning here in Daniel chapter four is that's the crazy life. It really is. The crazy life is a life that's not centered on God, but it's centered on ourselves. Did you know, I just learned this, there are only three passages that I know of in scripture where God is laughing and you find them in the book of Psalms and all three times do you know why God laughs each time he laughs because man is boasting about something that he's done that tickles God it makes him laugh in probably a derisive way the story of Nebuchadnezzar is the story of God taking a man who thinks he's a God and makes him act like an animal for seven years in order to restore his sanity as a man. And God didn't get pleasure out of it. Please understand that. God doesn't get pleasure out of doing this to Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't get pleasure when he has to do it to to you or to me, but he will take us the hard way if he has to. I was reminded this last week that, it was a, that it's a nine-day walk from Egypt to the promised land, but it took them 40 years. God will take us the long way if he has to. Whatever it takes to restore the sanity in our life, God will do that. And what is sanity? That's a good question. And what is sanity? Sanity is knowing that there is a God and you are not him and you're accountable to him. And so you're going to live according to those facts, those truths. That's sanity. So don't be insane. You know, one of the things that's so interesting about this letter that Nebuchadnezzar writes in chapter 4 is it's the only thing we have left of his empire today. Think about that for a minute. All the stuff that he builds, all the accomplishments that he's made, the only thing that's been circulated around the world and has been translated into thousands of languages is this story in the Bible in Daniel chapter 4, is this letter that Nebuchadnezzar wrote found here. The testimony of what God had done in his life is all that's left. Isn't that amazing? You know, it just might be that that's the most important thing. The only thing that's worth passing on is the testimony of what God has done in your life. And it's really comical in a way that here's a guy who's so full of pride, but all we have left of him is the story of how God humbled him. And he wanted that story told. That's why he told it. I think if he were standing here today and he talked about his time when he was eating grass, he would tell you that that's the worst thing that ever happened to him, but it was the best thing that ever happened for him. Even today, I think Nebuchadnezzar's testimony speaks to us. And I want to close by sharing with you two ways I believe his testimony speaks to us today. Number one is this, that God will pursue us. Even in our insanity, he'll pursue us. You know, in the first four chapters of the book of Daniel, God's pursuing Nebuchadnezzar. Think about it for a moment. Everything that God does in the first four chapters is to get the attention of King Nebuchadnezzar. He sends Daniel in chapter 1. He gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream in chapter 2, sends Daniel to interpret it, and then God gets his attention by showing up in a furnace of all places in chapter 3. And then in chapter 4, he sends him another dream and again gives him Daniel to interpret it and then on top of that God sends Nebuchadnezzar to humility school for seven years he makes him like an animal in order to restore his sanity as a man and even in his insanity God 
pursues him until finally, finally Nebuchadnezzar gets it. And six times in his letter, Nebuchadnezzar calls God the most high God. That is a breakthrough for a guy who once thought he was the hottest thing on planet Earth, that he was the tallest tree on Earth. That's a breakthrough. And that leads to the second lesson that we find in Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. Number two is that sometimes God has to cut us down to ground us again. Sometimes he has to cut us to the quick to ground us again. Do you know where the word humility comes from? It comes from a Latin word, humilius, which literally means from the earth. The word hummus also is, is part of that. Hummus means earth, from the earth. To be humble means to be grounded in reality, to understand who God is and to understand who we are. The reality is that, that he is the center and we are not. But so often the fact is that I have to be cut down to be grounded again. God will cut down a tree in order to save it and he'll cut down a man in order to save him. He had to do that with Nebuchadnezzar and he'll do it to you. But listen, and very importantly, he doesn't just do it for you. He does it to put you in a position so that you'll be a blessing to others. I want to remind you of what God said to Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel. And this is not going to be on the overhead, so just listen. Verse 27, back in Daniel chapter 4. Here's what Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. Now, that's very important to see. There is a relationship between King Nebuchadnezzar's pride and his neglect of the people he was supposed to serve, especially those who were marginalized, those who were in need. God had a heart for the poor. He had a heart for the oppressed in Babylon. And God's expectation for anybody in authority is that they're not to make their position about themselves. They're supposed to make their position about those whom they serve. Leaders who believe it's all about themselves shouldn't be serving in the first place. And Nebuchadnezzar, was so caught up in himself, so out of touch with the reality of people who are around him because he was thinking about himself. And that's what pride does, by the way. Pride clouds your vision so much that you don't notice, you don't care about others around you. Life becomes just kind of this hall of mirrors where all you can see is yourself. And so Daniel bravely speaks the truth to Nebuchadnezzar in power and tells him to repent of his sins. And one of the things that means is being kind to the oppressed. Why? It was because his pride blinded him to the needs of those who were marginalized, to those who were poor. Now, let me close by saying to this, I think this happens to us, doesn't it? It's such a temptation in our culture to make everything about me. And sometimes God has to cut us down in order to ground us and to remind us what it's all about. And he doesn't just do that for us. He does it for the sake of others. He, he humbles us so that we will be in a position to bless others. There are times in my life where I have felt a bit of superiority, uh, maybe even a bit of self-sufficiency, and God had to cut me down and allow me to feel a sense of inferiority so that he could ground me again. How about you? Has that ever happened to you? It may be this morning that through the word of God, the spirit, the Holy Spirit's prompting you and telling you, listen, it's not about you. It's about God. Everything you are, everything that you have, you have because of God. You know, one of the things that Scripture teaches us in Acts 2.38, when we're told to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, just as Nebuchadnezzar was told to repent, we're told to repent and be baptized. And one of the things that we learn about baptism in Romans chapter 6 is that when you're buried in baptism, you die on the cross. You die to yourself, and you're raised to walk in newness of life to live for God. You know, it may be that you need to heed God's call to repent of your sins, to believe in Jesus Christ, confess his name, and be baptized. And I want to tell you that even though we're going through this pandemic, we will meet you here at any moment to hear your confession, to baptize you into Christ just the way they did in the first century. We'd be honored to do that. 
But if you need to pray with any one of our leaders or with me, please don't hesitate to call on us. We want to pray with you and be there for you. I want to close by reminding you that Jesus, the scripture says, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's what we're about to celebrate right now through communion. And we're going to sing this song now to prepare our hearts and our minds. My precious Savior suffered pain and agony. He bore it all. He bore it all. That I might be. I with him might live. He broke the bonds of sin and set the captive free. He bore it all. all that, that I, I might live. In his presence live. He bore it Jesus all. Jesus bore it all. I might see his shining, see his shining face. He bore it free. all. He bore it all. That I might live. I with him might live. I stood Jesus to my place. place, he bore it all, all that, that I, I might, might live. In his presence live, they the placed a crown of thorns upon my Savior's head. He bore it all, he bore it all that I might fly with him, might live. My cruel man with spears, his side with spears and blood. He bore it all, all that, that I, I might, might live. In his presence live, he bore it Jesus all that I might Shining face, he bore it all. Freely bore it all. That I might live. I with him might live. I stood condemned, stood condemned to, to die. die. But Jesus took my, took my place. He bore it all. all that, that I, I might, might live. In his presence live. A Calvary's healing shame. The blessed Savior trod. He bore it all. Freely bore it all. That I might I live. With him might live. Between two thieves they crucified the Son of God. He bore it all, all that, that I, I might, might live. In his presence live, he bore it Jesus all bore that it all. I might see his shining, shining face. He bore it all, he bore it all that I might live. I with him might live, I stood condemned him to die. die. But Jesus took my place. place, he bore it all, all that, that I, I might, might live. In his presence live. To help focus our attention on communion today, I wanted to read a few verses from uh, Colossians chapter 1. As all of our attention seems to be on what is going on in the world around us, I thought it important that we bring the focus back to the promise of God that he would send us on to redeem us. And while the world may seem to be the focus, maybe we can decrease our worldly focus and increase our focus on Christ and can have confidence each day in knowing that God is in control of all things. The Lord's Supper is a wonderful place to help remind us of just that. I'm going to read in Colossians chapter 1. I'll start in verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And in speaking of Jesus, he says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Verse 23, if you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant 
and we as believers and baptized Christians also. Let's have prayer for the bread. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you, Father, that you had a plan to redeem us to you. And right now, as we try to reduce in our minds things going on in the world, help us to lift up Christ. Help his sacrifice to be on our minds as we take of this bread this morning, as it represents his body that was shed on the cross for our sins. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's continue with our prayer for the cup. Father, we do con continue our, our prayer now and thinking uh, also of the cross and uh, this cup that we're about to partake of that reminds us of his blood and the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Again, help our cross to be on, our focus to be on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. We have the opportunity each week to be able to uh, give to the uh, work that continues to go on. Um, here we can participate in that by giving online and, uh, or by mailing our checks into the office. Um, we just ask that you continue to support the work here through your giving and knowing that the works that are going on um, are carrying out the works and the will of God in this area and around the world. Now let's have a prayer for the offering. Father God, um, you've given so much to us, uh, and out of our abundance, um, we ask that you just receive the offering that we're presenting to you at this time, and uh, we just pray that um, each of the funds that, that are collected will uh, go to carry out your work and your will, whether it's in this church, whether it's in this community, whether it's around the world. Thank you again for just the way that you bless our lives and the abundance and the things that you provide us each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Since the love of God has shed priceless blessings on my head, I have made, I have made it, my own. it my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule, it shall rule. there alone. If the heart is made of dwelling, dwelling place, the love of God, the love of God goes like a flame, goes like a flame. To endless years, to endless years, it is the same. It is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see Him face to face. Since the Son of God came down with His love, our lives to crown, He with us would remain. Greater love there could not be, Jesus died for you and me in our hearts. He would reign, the love of God. Face to face, while his 
love burns true and bright. We are walking in the light He has shown us the road. We His glory must reflect, lest our dimness and neglect keep some souls from its dark. The love of God. If the heart is made wounds dwelling place, the love of God goes like a flame. Who in the shade it is the same. The love of God will never fail to lose its glory till we see it face to face. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have extended to us through your Son. We thank you, dear God, for those answered prayers that we have brought before your throne as your children. For those that have been relieved of pain due to accidents, for those that have been healed from sickness, for those who continue continue to improve for long-lasting illnesses that have affected their life. We give you thanks. Our Father, we ask that during this time of trial and tribulations that the nation is going through and even the world with a pandemic that is affecting so many people and many even with loss of life, that we pray that you will give us the wisdom and the knowledge to rely strictly upon you and those things that you have imparted to man in the scientific field to be able to help us get out of the predicament that we're in. And Father, as we approach coming back together to worship you in person, and as we contemplate that and as we make plans, we pray for your wisdom your guidance, and your direction so that we may meet in safety and we may meet, be encouraged one to another and to glorify you. We thank you for all the blessings you have given us and those that you have promised us for the future. For we ask this in your son's precious name, for Jesus who died upon the cross for us. Amen. I'd like to leave you with a passage for you to have as peace in your life for this week. As Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 4, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications, and with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Have a wonderful week.